Hello everyone, greetings and welcome to all of you, wherever you might be right now. I thank you for tuning in. For this act of joining is, after all, a compliment, an expression of a friendly hypothesis, an expression of the assumption that something could be said in this little speech that might be of significance to you personally. So once again, a warm welcome to all of you. Today I am broadcasting in your direction from the Thomas Mann House in Pacific Palisades. And I would like to start with a question that has been troubling me and that has stuck in my head for days now. This question was asked by Jerry Brown, governor of California until 2019, a climate activist from day one, an experienced politician who ran for US president three times. His question was, can we build a civilization based on news and hypes? Jerry Brown had invited me to his ranch, a good two hours drive north of San Francisco. We drove across parched land, endless, dust-blown pastures with yellowish, wilted grass and the occasional dried-up Greek bed. There were hardly any animals left out here, Jerry Brown told me. Only lots of insects, lizards, sometimes coyotes. Livestock production had become unprofitable. And it was, he said, getting hotter and hotter and more and more inhospitable year after year. The olive trees that still grow here had to be treated with a kind of sun protection spray so that they would not dry up. He could, said Jerry Brown, experience the catastrophe of climate change here and now. Jerry Brown's innocent-sounding question, whether it may be possible to build a civilization based on news and hypes, contains two explosive propositions. First, what is new and what is interesting and what dominates the media at the moment is not necessarily what is actually relevant. Did a politician by chance briefly take off his mask on a plane and thus violate COVID regulations? Do we have any photos of this? Is some kind of professional troublemaker causing a stir by posting an ugly tweet? Are Donald Trump and his lies making a comeback? In no time, this is followed by a flood of comments and responses. From the interplay of social and editorial media emerges the hype, targeting individuals and obsessed with personal character and integrity issues. The problem is that attention is scarce and that it can be invested only once. Those who let themselves be captivated by all of this are incapable of thinking about anything else during this time. This means as a consequence, the more dominant the nonsense news and the bigger the general excitement about irrelevant topics, the more massive the obstruction of halfway meaningful debates. At least for a few days or weeks, one mentally lives in a sphere of white noise and a cloud of nothingness. None of this remains. None of this is of any importance for the future. And none of this is really relevant for action. Jerry Brown's question, however, contains a second, more fundamental dimension. Ever since taking this tour of the heat and sun-scorched ranch, I have been thinking that public attention has been stuck in the wrong time sphere, especially in the face of today's looming crisis. We respond in short-term mode to dangers that require long-term thinking. The American ecologist and author Stuart Brand has developed a small, elegant thought model that helps refine this idea. He distinguishes between different time spheres and speeds of civilization. Changes in the process of evolution happen extremely slowly, at the pace of centuries and millennia. Culture change, too, takes a long time. 
politics, ideally, is determined by a medium speed that rejects the real-time hustle and bustle. Trade, on the other hand, responds quickly. Finally, the world of fashion is extremely fleeting, mood-driven, a merely seasonal affair determined by a suddenly erupting hype. According to Stuart Brand, the fundamental difficulty is that humans in the Anthropocene are changing their environment in ever extensive ways and for centuries and for millennia to come, while the human brain is governed by a pathologically short attention span that does not grasp these changes in their deep temporal dimension and therefore cannot find a way to debate and address these changes. So somebody has yet again called for banning domestic flights or reducing the consumption of cheap meat. And boom, we have another trendy and trending spectacle about the terror of virtue and green hypermorality, complete with the latest poll on the topic. The all-important question of what to do to reduce climate change in the face of forest fires, droughts, and heat-related fatalities receives no attention or discussion. This, after all, would require different temporal horizons. It would require long-term planning and contentious debates driven by content. And it would require saying farewell to fetishizing novelty, excitement, the merely sensational and confrontational. I would argue that the cult of short-termism has long had toxic effects, for it allows political action to shrink to overheated reactive business, fetters the conceptual imagination, and results in a syndrome that the author, Elias Boulding, has called temporal exhaustion. Already back in 1978, she wrote, if one is mentally out of breath all the time, from dealing with the present, there is no energy left for imagining the future. Yet, in my opinion, it is this very long-term thinking and a relaxed debate, in the best sense of the word, about a different future that is of existential necessity in the face of today's crisis. Whether we are talking about climate change, species extinction, the fight against pandemics, the triumph of an aggressive populism, the dangers of disinformation. All of these topics are not even remotely addressed by the flaring spectacle and hype of the moment. It is as if one was staring at a few individual whitecaps, at the sea spray whirling in the wind, while the important thing is to develop an eye for the big picture and a feeling for the tectonic shifts taking place below the surface of the sea. Being caught up in the moment becomes dangerous when it is necessary to act quickly and decisively, globally and with foresight, knowing that the effects, as in the case of climate change, may make themselves felt only several decades later. This is the situation we are stuck in right now. Sometimes in dark, pessimistic moments, I cannot shake the feeling that this is indeed the real appeal of nonsense news and media hypes. Displacing what is important, displacing the really critical things with the merely sensational, flashy, banal things that flicker across our screens and displays in a numbing intensity. I'm not saying that this kind of distraction happens deliberately. This would be unfounded conspiracy thinking. It is rather that the excitement of the moment, in my view, represents a flight from complexity and an easing of a restlessness and an anxiety about the future that has been around for some time. And yet one must add immediately that there are all kinds of disinformation professionals in the media business who deliberately launch topics and relegate others 
through the skillfully orchestrated littering of public space. One need only think of a media mogul such as Rupert Murdoch, who has transformed the disorientation of entire societies into a business model. He has managed to destabilize the political situation on three continents at once. In the UK, his people promoted Brexit with false claims. In Australia, they declared the fact of human-made climate change to be a fabrication, even as the country was on fire and billions of animals were burned to death. And in the United States, Murdoch's Fox News helped Donald Trump get elected. But let me say it once again. Ordinarily, it simply happens that we allow ourselves to be distracted. Not because some media moguls pursue their sinister plans, but because the interplay of human psychology, digital economy, and modern media technologies creates its own pull, a pull that the artist and writer Jenny O'Dell has called an arms race of urgency. With everyone being able to join in by posting and commenting, the fight for attention gets tougher and tougher. Matching the interests of the public, human longings, intentions and fascinations can be spied upon and hypes can be fueled in ever more refined and perfect ways. So that, at the end of the day, millions of people around the world laugh about the same video and wonder what happened to the baby lion that a baboon somewhere in South Africa had dragged into a tree for grooming and cuddling. The baby lion baboon story, by the way, was a global hype. Thanks to the hard currency of real-time rates, we know that so-called interspecies love stories receive a crazy number of clicks. But the problem is, of course, not a few individual stories going viral. The problem is the systematic exploitation of human attention. And we cannot only talk about this form of abuse in the individualistic, non-political categories of digital detox enthusiasts and mindfulness gurus who turn the global problem of information organization into a personal wellness issue, according to the motto, let's get away from the general news smog. I need quality time just for myself. This is, I think, the wrong approach. For attention is a fundamentally political category. The real-time rush of an excitement industry that does not see its audience as responsible citizens, but instead degrades them to immature users eager to click around, does not just increase the stress level for every individual. This real-time hustle and bustle eats up energies to think about the future. It robs the public debate of substance. It narrows our perspective by creating a collective fixation on the present, an atmosphere of the total now. So what to do? How to promote long-term thinking to make the existential crisis of our times hurt and to make them count? I too would love to have a few quick answers and ready-made recipes, but these do not exist. And yet, what could one do? Stuart Brand, together with others, is building a gigantic clock in a mountain in Texas that is supposed to tick for 10,000 years. The clock is intended to create a deeper awareness of time. It is meant to inspire long-term thinking. At age 83, Jerry Brown, in interviews and statements, continues to attack the weakening of political imagination through nonsense news. That is, he chooses the tool of criticism. I, for my part, believe that we have long needed a kind of planetary journalism that from an eagle's perspective sorts the developments, sees sustainability as a news factor, analyzes efficient forms of crisis management and vehemently demands this kind of crisis management from our increasingly short-termist politics. All of this is certainly important, 
But what can be done right here and right now? In her book, How to Do Nothing, Jenny O'Dell unfolds a suggestion. It's a simple suggestion. Tune out for a while. Turn off. Disrupt the fixation on the spectacle of the moment. Not, however, and this is the crucial point, in order to pamper your soul, but as an act of self-affirmation and resistance, as an intellectual declaration of independence. The important thing is to uncover one's very own thoughts and to be constantly searching for new alliances and for the right mix of contemplation and participation, knowledge and engagement. In fact, we have not lost this freedom to withdraw while we move toward an even deeper involvement. True, it has become more difficult to withdraw, but it is still possible. For, as the writer David Foster Wallace once said, we human beings are lords of our own tiny skull size kingdoms. That means we can avert our gaze and we can ignore the attention cannibals and the provocation of the day in order to focus on a single, truly dramatic question in our crisis-ridden time. What does really matter? Dear listeners, dear viewers, attention is political and precious and scarce. So thank you very much for tuning in. I wish you well.